And so uh, we just want to be praying for him. I'll turn over to John chapter 3, and let's pick up uh, in this amazing gospel. And these are verses that often uh, we, we may not be as familiar with. Uh, certainly, we looked at Nicodemus last week. We look at the Samaritan woman in the next chapter. Um, but these verses are kind of tucked in there, but they have so much to communicate to us. Now, when I was in high school, uh, my favorite race, I ran track, and my favorite race was the mile relay. And uh, it had a couple of interesting dynamics to it that just single-person races don't have. One is you have different people running, and it's a team event. And the other thing is the baton pass can make or break the race. And, uh, and so there's this baton pass that goes on. This is the mixed uh, relay from the Olympics in Tokyo. The first time they did a mixed relay with men and women running uh, together, two men, two women. But you can see there, the baton pass is about to happen. Now, in 1980, they moved from the mile standard to the meter standard, uh, from English units to metric units, so it's now the 1600 meter. Uh, but you have 20 meters to make that baton pass. And actually, in the Tokyo Olympics, the American team did something, and they were disqualified because of the way the baton pass went. Now, they appealed it, and it turns out that some of the track officials had done something, actually, that made them do what they did, and so then they were back in the race. But the baton pass is a really, really big deal. And... And what we have in the verses that we're going to look at this morning is they give us a unique perspective of the handoff between all of the Old Covenant into the New Covenant from the prophets and priests and kings that we read about throughout the Old Testament, John the baptizer being the last prophet to the one to whom they all pointed all of those baton passes from person to person, from King David to King Solomon, from Elijah to Elisha, from Aaron as high priest to his son as the high priest, all of those baton handoffs were all leading up to this handoff. Because this handoff was not between a King David and a King Solomon or Elijah and Elijah, it wasn't between two people. This is between John the baptizer handing the baton to he who is the king, he who is the prophet, he who is the high priest. And, and so this is the ultimate and final handoff of the passing of the baton from John the Baptist to Jesus the Christ. And so let me, uh, we'll read these verses 22 to 36. And if you would, please stand with me. And before we read them, let me just simply ask for God's help, even as we read these, because uh, the Spirit of God who gave these words to John wants to give them to us in a very personal and unique way this morning. So let me pray, and then we will read these verses. Uh, Spirit of the living God, would you just open our eyes to see wonderful things from this, your word? And in fact, would even what John says was his prayer, that you would increase and he would decrease. Spirit of God, may you increase in what we know about you and we decrease. May you increase in our emotions and we decrease. May you increase in our own wills and may we decrease. So use your word to transform us and we're excited about what you're going to do. And it is in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so John chapter 3, beginning in verse 22. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he was spending time with them and baptizing. John also was baptizing in Anon near Salome, 
because there was much water there and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Therefore, there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with a Jew about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified Behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. What he has seen and heard, of that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. May God use his word in our lives this morning. You may be seated. So verse 22 tells us that after these things, after Jesus coming uh, to, the, uh, to Jerusalem and the Passover, cleansing of the temple, his night conversation with Nicodemus, after these things that he and his disciples came into the land of Judea down to the Jordan River there, and, and they were uh, baptizing. Now, if we jump over to chapter 4, Uh, Verse 2, it says, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but his disciples were. Uh, The clear indication is that Jesus never personally baptized anybody in water. The people who were coming to follow Jesus, his disciples would baptize them in water. And this almost seems to reserve the, the role of Jesus of baptizing them in the Holy Spirit that John the Baptist had proclaimed. And so Jesus and his followers are down by the River Jordan, and John and the Baptist is up a little bit further north on the, in the Jordan River. And, and so they're both simultaneously uh, calling people to repentance and, and, and are baptizing people. And this is something we often miss, because if you read Matthew and you read Mark, In those two Gospels, it goes from Jesus' baptism to his temptation, and then it says John was imprisoned, and then he picks up with Jesus' public ministry. Even in Luke, it goes from Jesus being baptized to his temptation to his ministry in Galilee. And those, those Gospels preceded this Gospel being written. So John here in verse 24 says, John had not yet been thrown into prison. And so we get this glimpse into this passing lane, if you will, of the baton that probably took three, four, five months where John is... John the baptizer is baptizing, Jesus, is, his disciples are baptizing, and so these are going on concurrently for those several months as this transition is made from all of the Old Testament, all of that into Christ and the New Testament. And so that is all going on. And we're told here then that there's a discussion, verse 25, therefore there arose a discussion. And you can imagine the discussions that probably took place. John is baptizing with his disciples, Jesus is baptizing with his disciples, and John's disciples, they they have this discussion, and here we're let in on that discussion. The discussion was from John's disciples 
with a Jew about purification. And here the purification is the moral purification. How does someone who is unclean, how is a sinner made right with the absolute pure and holy God? That is the discussion. And of course, we've sung a lot about that already this morning, haven't we? And we've witnessed a proclamation of how that happens through Christ and His holy life and His crucifixion and His resurrection. And, and so they're talking about this purification, but you can see that underneath the surface of this, if you will, kind of a doctrinal question, there's some hurt feelings, There's a little bit of jealousy. There's some competitiveness that's going on because John's disciples are saying, hey, he's drawing more of a crowd than you and we are, John. And there's probably this sense of becoming obsolete. That's not an easy pill to swallow for us people. And so... We then have John answer, and John answers, John the Baptist answers so consistently with who he is. And he uses this unsettled feelings in the hearts of his disciples to to just tell them probably one more time what his role is. What the particular race that God had given to him and how it was a transitory role. And the ultimate point of it was to pass the baton to the one who was infinitely greater than him. Now, it's a little bit hard to tell if all of these words from 22 to 35 come from John the the baptizer, or if in verse 31, John the apostle steps in. And those are his words. That's the way I would take this, because I think this is John, in hindsight, coming back and again emphasizing who Jesus is, which I think you have to have a lot of hindsight on to be able to capture some of these amazing realities. Um, But John the Baptist, and these are written out in your notes, but I'm just going to walk through them here. John the Baptist says... um, Verse 27, John answered and said, a man can receive nothing unless it has been given him from heaven. And so John says, just remember, a person only can receive what God gives. And of course, we we sang about this a few minutes ago, didn't he? He's worthy of it all because it all comes from him and it is all to return back to him. A couple of verses James 1.17 reminds us that every good gift and every perfect gift is from where? If it has any good in it, I may be doing the good, but if it is good, it didn't originate in me. It originated from God. He gave that good gift, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. And in the Corinthian church, one of the things Paul constantly had to deal with was this comparison uh, over gifts and personalities and who you baptized and just about everything conceivable and, and the competitiveness that that brings. And so he says in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, for who regards you as superior? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast and if you, as if you did not receive it. Why are you bragging about your spiritual gift? It was given to you. Brag about the one who gave it to you. Why are you bragging about your spiritual influence? The only reason you have spiritual influence is because of God giving it to you. Brag about Him. And, and so that's part of what is going on here. So John just quickly reminds them that He has what he has, and he's been given the ministry that he has been given because it was given to him from heaven. Verse 28, you yourselves are my witnesses that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. 
And here he just says, you've heard me tell you this. You know, it's one thing to realize you're ending up in a diminished role and because you have to, to say, yeah, they're doing better. But John is reminding them, I've been saying this from the get-go. I understood this from the get-go, that I had a transitory ministry. And my whole job was to hand the baton to Jesus. So this is not new information. Oh, it's hard emotionally. It's hard to move from such a vibrant ministry where everybody was coming to us and then baptizing Jesus, and now they're all going to him. But he says, that's the point. That is the point of the whole thing. And then he gives an illustration right out of their culture. He says, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. In a Jewish wedding, well, first of all, the closest of all human relationships by the design of God is a husband and wife. It is marriage. And in fact, in Ephesians 5, Paul even intimates that God created marriage to be a picture of his relationship between God and Israel, and in that case, God to the church. And and so that's the most intimate relationship. And as you go through the, the Old Testament, what you realize is that several times Israel is called the wife of God the bride of God. And of course, that comes right into the New Testament where the church is the bride of Christ. And in fact, when Israel was not loving God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength, when they were going after idols, what was it called? What was it called? Adultery. It was called adultery. And and so we see this throughout And so he picks up on this metaphor, and in a Jewish wedding, the one who kind of handled it all is this friend of the bridegroom here. Had a very specific name, a shoshpin, and they had a unique role. They were the entire liaison between the bride and the groom. They'd send out the wedding invitations, they'd get the whole wedding set up, but their most important responsibility was to guard the bride and not let some false groom in to take advantage of her. And because the groom would come at night, he had to recognize the voice of the groom. And what does John say here? Because of the bridegroom's voice, I rejoice greatly. And you can see how John's ministry out in the wilderness there was to get the bride of God, Israel, to come to repentance to be ready for the groom, to get her cleaned up. Now, it happened one by one by one. But he was baptizing people if they would repent of their sins and they would turn to God for the forgiveness and for the cleansing of their sins. And all of that was a preparatory work to get the bride ready. And when Jesus showed up, he certainly says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But he also says, That's the voice of the groom. That's the voice of the groom. And it fills my heart with joy to get the groom in his rightful role over the bride. And so he says, that's what I have done. And so this, my joy, has been made full. Nothing is sweeter in John's heart than that. And then the resultant declaration, he must what? Increase. But I must decrease. I have run the race God gave to me. I have handed 
the baton. I must decrease. And certainly he was even saying to those who were following him, yeah, we're becoming obsolete. Oh, we had a key role for a time. Our role has been fulfilled. And you even wonder if some of his private conversations he did, he, he said to the, just go south and begin and join those following Jesus. Become a part of his ministry. Well, in verse 31 then, uh, it's as if the gospel writer turns his focus from John and John pointing to Jesus to now just the spotlight shining on Jesus. And we have a six-fold description of who Jesus is here, beginning in verse 31. First of all, he who comes from above and is above all, he who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth, he who comes from heaven is above all. Now we get the point of that verse because he says it twice, right? What's the point of it? He is what? Above all. And he makes this distinction between what comes from heaven and what is of earth. Now Jesus made this same distinction to Nicodemus the night that he met with him. If you go over to verse 12 of this chapter, Jesus said, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things. And this is a very important distinction to keep in mind, that there are earthly things. People come out of the earth. Adam came out of the earth, and therefore they are earthy. Jesus came out of heaven, therefore he is heavenly. And Paul, in fact, picks up this whole idea In 1 Corinthians 15, as he's talking about um, the future resurrection, he says, Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. The first man was from the what? A man of dust. Second man, that would be Christ, is from heaven. As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of the dust. Who would that be? That would be us. So are those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Who are those? Those are those of us who have put our faith and trust in Christ. We are of the dust, but Christ's great work makes us of heaven. That's his grand redemptive work. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. And so he he tries to make uh, this distinction very clear between what is earthly and what is heavenly. And boy, have we muddled that up in our world today? I mean, if we could get this one distinction straight... It would solve probably every problem we had. And so it's an important distinction that, that is being made here. And verse 32 then just takes it to the next step. What he, Jesus, has seen and heard, of that he testifies... Let's just stop there. Of that he testifies. What Jesus, where is he from? Heaven. So what he has seen in heaven and heard in heaven, that is what he is testifying. That's what he is saying to us. Now think about this. There's a few thousand years at least that have gone on before Jesus is incarnated. He, he saw all of that. Deuteronomy 29.29 29 says that the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Well, guess what? All those secret things that belong to God? Yeah, Jesus had heard those too. 
He'd been a part of making those plans from eternity past. And, and so John here is just emphasizing that he who came down from heaven is telling us things that we would never know apart from him coming. We know this in every area of life. In a family, mom and dad, they talk. They make plans for the family. How do the kids figure out what the plans are? They either just experience them or one of them tells them what the plans are because they were not there when the plans were made. And that's all John is saying here, that this one who has come from heaven, he has seen things and he has heard things and he was sent to tell us of those things. Now, no one receives his testimony, that's probably a hyperbole, because in the next verse it says, he who has received his testimony has set his seal to this, that God is true. Those who listen to him say, true, 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 true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. Of course, how did John begin this whole gospel? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He gives that proper name to Jesus, and here he just reemphasizes that. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God. In other words, listen to him. Listen to him, for he gives the Spirit without measure. Now, this could be taken one of two ways. In the Old Testament, when God called somebody to a particular task, he would give the Holy Spirit by measure, by a certain degree of measurement. Could be for a certain period of time, could be to do certain things. This is a reference to when Jesus came, God gave, the Father gave the Spirit without measure to Christ, infinitely to Christ. And of course, we see that happening specifically at his baptism. It could also be that the He is Jesus, and Jesus gives the Spirit without measure. And I believe both are absolutely true, because remember John introduced him that I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes, because he's a person, when a person believes in Christ, you get him without measure. You get all of him. You get all of him. But uniquely of Christ, unlike anybody else who had ever run the race, who had ever been on earth, Jesus also had the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. He has given all things into His hands. So two things there. If you mess with the Son, you're messing with the one the Father loves. And God has entrusted all things into his hands. And thus Jesus would say a few more times in his ministry, your response to me is your response to God the Father. Because he has given all things into my hands. In 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Paul picks up this whole thing. And he talks about how uh, the Father has given everything to the Son for a time. In fact, let's just read it together. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the firstfruits, then it is coming those who belong to Christ." And then he gets into what he says about Jesus here. Then comes the end. 
when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, for God has put all things in subjection under his feet. Twice he's said that, right? Here in John it says he's put all things into his hands. But when he says all things are put in subjection, it's plain that he is accepted who put all things in subjection under him. That would be the Father. When all things are subject to him, then the Son himself will also be subjected to him, the Father, who put all things in subjection under him, Christ, that God may be the all in all. So God the Father has handed the building of the kingdom of God, if you will, to Christ. And he's given him all that authority. There is a day, and one by one, people come to Christ. Or maybe they come in groups, just like Sultan. And they come into a relationship with Christ. There is a day coming when God, Jesus Christ will put an end to all power and authority that is in rebellion to him. Satan, the demons, worldly leaders, everybody. And the final enemy that's going to be wiped out is what? Death itself. Death itself. And when the kingdom is fully established with all of us who have ever put our faith and trust in him over all the millenniums, then he's going to take that kingdom. He's going to take all of that and he's going to hand it back to the Father and say, job done. Job done. Can you imagine that? And that's what John is referring to here. He's saying, the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Now, there's two responses to who Jesus is that are clear in this passage, one of rejection and one of reception. The one of rejection is, I'm not going to believe anything that comes from heaven. I'm going to be one of that mass that will not receive Jesus' testimony. Or at the end of verse 36, I'm going to be the one who does not obey the Son. And of course, the consequences are that they will not see life. Their existence on earth is the most life they will ever experience. But the wrath of God abides on him or her. But those who receive, when they hear what God has said, they say, true. It's true. It's true. He's telling us things that he has seen and heard. It's true. And those who believe in the Son, verse 36, have what? Eternal life. A quality of life and a quantity of life that is eternal in its nature. And so, because Jesus is not Jan the Baptist... You could maybe blow off John the Baptist, but if you blow off Jesus, ooh, the consequences are infinitely, eternally more consequential. And that's the point that John is making here. And so how do we respond to God's word this morning? Well, first of all, what's our response to who Jesus is? And here's just a quick summary of what I walked through and what these verses say. He comes from above and he's above all. He comes to tell us heavenly things which he personally knows. God sent Jesus and he speaks the words of God. He has the spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son. The Father has given all things into the hands of his Son. And when we live under him, all those things come together and make sense and add up. So the first question is, do you know him? Have you received Jesus as that person? 
that person as the Savior, as the Lord. And if you have not, then this morning is a great opportunity to do it. Because if you do not obey the Son, you will not see life, but you will experience the full wrath of God. But those who have received him, whew, we get it all because Jesus is over all. And what a life he gives to us. There's also, I think, a lesson from John the Baptist for us in this. The lesson that we, we only receive what God gives. And so whatever we have, it came from God. Let's not take any credit for it. Let's make sure the credit is given where the credit's due. And let's not be comparing ourselves and contrasting and doing all those things. And, and let's verbalize this. Let's tell people what God has given to us. And I mean, we need to say some of this that we didn't used to have to say even 20 years ago. God has made me a man. God has... Caused me to be born in America in my case. God has given me an ability to know him. God has given me a chance to pastor this church. Whatever it is, let's just say it and give credit to God for what it is. Now, none of us are the friend of the bridegroom. That was a unique ministry of John. But what's your unique role in building the kingdom of God? What is your unique role? You have one. If you know Christ and you're still living, you have one. What is it? Just be clear on it and do not compete, do not compare. Because when you do that, your joy will be be made full. And the constant prayer of all of us is what? He must increase, I must decrease. That's just called sanctification. That's called transformation. I want you to bow your heads and just respond to the living God this morning. Either by worshiping and adoring He who has saved you or obeying Him for the first time ever and transferring your trust to Jesus as the Lord, the Messiah, the Savior, the one who can purify you and make you fit to have a relationship with God. If you have a relationship with God, how are you living it out like John the Baptist was in his unique role? How are you living it out in your unique role? Well, Holy Spirit, we thank you for the way that you've answered the prayer that we began with and the way that you have increased Jesus in the way we understand him, our emotional well-being, or even the way we use our will to choose. We thank you for increasing him and decreasing us. And even in the role that you've called us to play in your kingdom. We just want to say thanks be to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And may we live out faithfully what you have entrusted to us. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.